resume. Alright, so the topic of the President's report for this year's convention um, was decided upon by the ORCOM, as usual, uh, and in some ways was a response to uh, the topic that was raised at our European conference in Frankfurt last fall, um, namely uh, how is Platypus an educational project, um, which was attempted to be addressed through a panel of our members. Um, but what we discussed on the ORCOM was that this would be a better topic for a president's report than for a member's panel. But then we had the member's panel uh, earlier on uh, a similar but different topic, namely lessons in Platypus. Um, you know, what does Platypus teach? Uh, what have we learned through Platypus? Um, <clears throat> uh, because the issue of the educational project is really more of a kind of meta topic. It's more of a reflective topic. And my own, so this was decided upon by the ORCOM. Uh, my own hesitation about having this topic be uh, that of the President's report for this year was that I was afraid that it would essentially be a repeat of last year. So last year's President's report was how is Platypus a pre-political project. Um, and as I mentioned in the, in the members' plenary just a little while ago, um, it, there is a way in which we're returning to this question, but uh, in a different way. Um, so just uh, to begin with, um, I want to remind us of something that I've mentioned at prior conventions, uh, namely the inspiration for Platypus in terms of what Richard and myself in particular, but also others like Spencer and Atiyah and Sunni and Stephanie, you know, the kind of early, early pre-generation of Platypus, what we thought we had to offer, what we could do, and specifically Richard and my experience as Spartacus youth members. In other words, when we looked back on our own experience of being politicized and really formed in a fundamental way, by our education in the Spartacist League, um, what was that, how, how was it achieved, and how could we reproduce it in some way? So the formulation that I came up with was that uh, we want to reproduce a Spartacist education on the problem of the left, of the pseudo-left, the fake left, what we call in Platypus the dead left. So pseudo-left and fake left, those are more Spartacist terms. So we just say, simply put, the dead left. Um, but without the pretension to either being or building of the revolutionary vanguard. Um, so in other words, the way they justify their education, we put to one side in their self-understanding, how they understand themselves doing it, what's motivating it, and what they're accomplishing in it, we put to one side. Um, Precisely because I think my experience as an organizer for the Spartacus Youth Club, uh, Richard's experience being around the Spartacists, was that we were impressed that the ideas were important, but what they were doing in practice was less important, less interesting, and more delusional, in fact. Um, and so even this idea of trying to sustain a memory because if you push groups like not only the Spartacist League and their ersatz uh, imitators or uh, offspring uh, like the IBT, but even a group that's as rankly opportunist as the ISO in terms of uh, movement building, that at the end of the day, the self-understanding is, in fact, keeping ideas alive. So the ISO, for example, if you go to their conference, and you go to their organizing meeting. So Jacob Kaya went to their organizers meeting at the ISO convention conference two years ago and immediately confronted with, we're not in a revolutionary situation. 
there won't be a revolution, a socialist revolution in the United States for 100 years. And so what are we doing, right? What are we doing at the ISO, that is? Um, we're keeping certain ideas alive, right? Uh, now, again, how they do so then, like in other words, if we are doing something similar, then the difference is in the how of it. Uh, meaning they think that you keep the ideas alive through contact with activism. Uh, we are not so sanguine about that. In other words, we think that that subjects these ideas that are supposedly being sustained to an immediate distortion. <coughs> and that in fact, you know, something that's come up certainly more poignantly around the Sanders campaign, um, we think that groups like the ISO are really educating people to be Democrats. Right? So what they're really keeping alive is the New Deal, right? Because they, like Stalinists, like the CPUSA, basically see the 1930s as a high, high water mark. Um, they take that as their model. Um, and so even though they claim to be keeping alive the ideas of Marxism, of Leninism, of Trotsky in some ways, of Luxembourg, uh, in fact, what they're keeping alive is the 30s which is not that at all. Even though Trotsky lived in, in, into the 30s, and Lenin and Luxembourg, of course, did not, um, still, they fundamentally misconstrue what Trotsky was. Right? They see him as the left of the popular front. In other words, the principal left opposition, left pole of the popular front. Whereas, in fact, Trotsky did not see himself that way. He saw himself, rather, living through a time of entire generations thrown into discord. <coughs> Entire generations thrown into discard. Right? Organizations that are dead. Right? Social democracy and communism, Stalinism, dead. Uh, but of course, no Trotskyists today, the way they go about their activity could really share Trotsky's own perspective on it. Um, so, that brings in the other aspect of our lineage. Um, namely, if <coughs> Richard and I have this foundational experience being educated about what's wrong with the left, how the left is fake, how the left is pseudo, um, how the left is betraying, right? We have that experience, but without it being tied immediately to the pretense of being some core nucleus of the vanguard of the future, of the revolution of the future, then what's the other element? Well, of course, the other element is the Frankfurt School. And this is where there's always friction between Richard and myself. Um, because, of course, w friction not at the level of for or against, but friction at the level of the how of it. Meaning, um, and this was raised earlier, in other words, the first generation of Platypus, where did they really come from? Did they not come from the anti-war movement, but rather come from my Adorno course at the Art Institute? Yeah, no, I know. I would, I would say sure, but I'd also say that I've taught the Adorno course at the Art Institute for twelve sure, years. Right, right. So, and the difference <laughs> being, you know, I no longer recruit students out of my Adorno course, but I did then because of the combination of the Adorno course and the anti-war movement, yes. right? And so that's why it's just a matter of emphasis and, and keeping both things in play. So the Frankfurt School, the Frankfurt School, notoriously. Uh, you know, most Marxists reject them as being any kind of Marxists because of the negativity. They're the dreary pessimists, the miserable anti-communists, whatever the Spartacists say in the pseudo-Marxist academic claptrap flyer that they have about Platypus. Um, right, that Adorno is a dreary anti-communist and, you know, pessimist, etc., etc. It's the negativity that's the hard part. Um, and so that's what I wanted to focus my comments on today. How is Platypus an educational project? Well, in a very peculiar way, namely that we're education via negativa. Uh, and again, via negativa at some distance from the activism. So we don't, we don't do via negativa through trying to intersect, right? which is the way the ISO understands activism, but it's also the way the Spartacists understand activism. So, Via negativa, just to bring it down to a more basic level, uh, means that we seek to discern and recognize what is wrong on the left so that we might be able to conceive, by contrast, what could be right. Um, 
the tricky part of this is that we're trying to make something absent present. So we're trying to feel the presence of an absence, which is not some kind of Derrida deconstruction, by the way, right? Um, but I'll get around to that. The problem of non-being. Right, I'm gonna, that's exactly Pippin, right, but I'll get there. Um, so let me reflect a little bit on, because uh, the specter hanging over this convention is, have we been doing this for 10 years? N not quite. We're entering our 10th year. And at the end of our 10th year, uh, we will be in 2017. <laughs> so the 10th year anniversary of Platypus will be the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution in Russia. Um, not uh, exactly coincident coincidentally, um, meaning that we've always been aware of this. When we started in 2007, our organization, we started the reading group in 2006, we did our first um, forum in January of 2007. We did some organizing towards that, but we didn't adopt our formal organizational statement of purpose and any kind of structure until April of 2007, until after we'd already put on a forum. And so then we, we reflected on, well, what do we need to be able to keep doing this kind of thing? <coughs> um, and you will have noticed that in the opening plenary this weekend, um, Carl Bellin kept on saying 100 years, 100 years, 100 years, 100 years ago, right? And, and he actually used a formulation that I had already come up with for this president's report last week, which is looking forward, looking backward. Right, are we looking forward or are we looking backward and what's the relationship of those two things? So let me just say personally, um, so roughly speaking, I've learned in the decade of trying to teach the fundamental ideas of Marxism um, that it is inevitable that often, if not always, I must, in my own personal role of trying to do this, sound, as Horkheimer put it in his conversation with Adorno in 1956, like an oracle. Now, about oracles, about oracles, the meaning of their prophetic insights is not for the speaker, but rather for the hearer. In other words, when the oracle speaks, it means nothing to the oracle itself, but rather to the, to the listener. Um, platypus is essentially what it means to you as the students. Uh, not really so much to me as the teacher. Um, if Platypus doesn't educate you, it educates no one. Now, of course, I have learned a great deal in Platypus in the way that um, one doesn't know what one thinks until one has said or written it. And one doesn't know what one knows until one tries to teach it. <coughs> but... My education in Platypus has been essentially learning about how to explain things rather than about the things in themselves. Um, and if you have some doubts about that, that I've already known about the things in themselves pretty much the same way that I know them today for a long time, just look at the founding documents. In other words, if you look at what we wrote, what I wrote with uh, consultation with my colleagues in the summer of 2006, it's all there, bonapartism, it's all, everything's there. Uh, you know, the same stuff I'm always talking about, it's been there before Platypus. Um, so I haven't learned anything about the thing, but I've learned maybe a little bit of how to explain it. Um, trying to make esoteric ideas explainable is a difficult task, and it is one that I have approached in a variety of ways the various aspects of Platypus as a project and its different activities. In other words, there's the reading group pedagogy, but there's also the pedagogy through the public forum. And it's the balance between those that we were talking about earlier, how that balance shifts, constantly shifts, but really you can't have one without the other. At least that's the organic discovery of the development of Platypus that Richard indicated earlier. Um, namely, that we've discovered along the way how to do this, but one thing that we have discovered is that that essential tension uh, between the public fora and the reading group is essential. In other words, that the reading group isn't really itself without the fora, and the fora are not really themselves without the reading group. Um, so these different ways of teaching, really. Um, teaching through hosting the conversation and teaching through discussion of readings. Um, 
Now, the difficulty comes in trying to make esoteric ideas explainable. Um, in trying to explain incoherence, right? So we're not only trying to make esoteric ideas explainable, but we're also trying to explain incoherence. In other words, when you look at the left today, really what we're dealing with is incoherence. Um, and I don't mean that in the colloquial sense of you know, uh, mere logic. It's not merely a logical problem. It's not that the left is illogical. They're not incoherent at that level. Of course not. Um, and so therefore, it's not a matter of our being able to explain incoherence out of some superior intelligence. It's not that. Um, as Lukács put it in his original 1922 preface to History and Class Consciousness, in defense of Hegel against Schopenhauer's claim of Hegel's alleged logical inconsistency, when one encounters contradiction, one must recognize a real historical social phenomenon and not merely a phenomenon of thought, meaning that one is in the pres presence of a real contradiction, not just a failure in thinking. And by, by a real contradiction, a societal contradiction. Um, as Lukács observed, the problem is how to express a riddle to which one does not know the answer. The riddle of the commodity form, right? So to express the riddle of the commodity form doesn't mean that you know the answer to the riddle, right? And again, we're back to the oracle, like the riddle of the sphinx, right? Um, the riddle of the sphinx to which the answer is man himself, right? But that doesn't mean that therefore you've arrived at an answer. Rather, you've posed the question, what is man? As Adorno, put it famously in his 1936 letter to Benjamin on the work of art in the age of mechanical <coughs> reproduction, um, one must try to grasp the self as well as mutually contradictory phenomena that are two halves of an integral freedom to which they do not, however, add up. Right. So uh, again, on one of our panels, what we have are these disintegrated fragments and shards of something that actually don't add up, right? So that's the kind of incoherence that we're talking about. Right? We're in the presence of the disintegrated and decomposed remnants of something, and we are putting them together, but we're putting them together to register the disintegration and the incoherence, rather than saying, okay, if you just put all these together, they, you could put Humpty Dumpty back together, it would be coherent, right? So again, the point of our panel is not to make the incoherent coherent, but rather to make the incoherence recognizable, which is different, again, via negativa. Uh, moreover, one must try to grasp such antinomical phenomena, which might, it might even be too optimistic for us to say that they're antinomical, in other words, that they contradict each other, right? The incoherence is such that they don't even really contradict each other. Um, how to grasp such phenomena critically that is to say, in how they point beyond themselves, right? Not critically in the sense of, that's wrong, but rather, that's wrong, but it suggests something beyond itself. Uh, which is to say, not positing them as they are, not positing the left as it is, dead, but rather as they ought to be, how they could and should be, but are not yet. Now that's when you're in this tricky domain of pointing beyond oneself, meaning are we pointing, as Joseph pointed out, to some kind of self-transformation of the left, or are we rather, is it a more qualitative break in transformation that we're suggesting the left beyond itself? Now, why that matters is that for Platypus, that break is not yet to happen. It's already happened a long time ago. In other words, the point of saying that the left is dead is to say that they're not merely wrong or inadequate, but that they are the result of a failed break. You know, of a break that was not productive, um, but a break that was simply destructive. Um, so they point beyond themselves, but maybe not as themselves. In other words, maybe they themselves are not going to go beyond themselves. Um, Robert Pippin. Uh, he, he formulated the task this way, so he's a Hegel scholar. 
um, who I studied with at the University of Chicago. It's the, the problem is in articulating what isn't without saying nothing. All right, again, the problem of the making something absent feel present. Present absence. Um, again, this is not a matter of a logical formula for making propositions, however critical or speculative, but rather it is importantly in terms of a felt reality, an aesthetic phenomenon, in fact, that is more intuited than conceptually grasped or <coughs> understood. Um, Richard has put it thus on many occasions that we seek to foster a sensibility, in other words, an ability to sense, a sensibility. This is different from a taste, however, uh, in terms of a preference, right? So again, it's not like we prefer some things on the left rather than others. It's not, it's not about cultivating a taste. Um, but rather a matter of critical judgment. In other words, judgment, not just conceptual slotting understanding, like this is this, that is that. Uh, but rather a more intuitive sensibility issue of aesthetic judgment felt reality. So we're trying to make an absence present, not just as a kind of rational, okay, that clicks, now we know, but rather to really feel it. Um, cultivating such a capacity for negative judgment, not this, not that, requires experience. Through multiple and many different cases, uh, this is what we seek to provide in Platypus. In other words, Platypus tries to, um, in that sense, foster experience. Can we have an experience of the dead left? Can we experience it? Uh, which raises another issue, which is experts, but I'll come back around to that. Because, um, of course, that's what an expert is. It's an experienced person. Um, the task, then, is in curating the cases both in their wide-ranging, diverse multiplicity, uh, seeking to leave nothing out, so we try to be as all-inclusive with respect to the dead left as possible, but also in terms of the approach to each and every case. Right? So the curation is about what to include, but also how to approach what we include. Um, so there I want to re-invoke something that I mentioned in a president's report a couple of years ago, Marx the famous 1843 letter to Ruga calling for the ruthless critique of everything existing, that the task is to clarify the confusion. To clarify the confusion of the would-be reformers. As Marx observed, there is no contradiction between remaining critical while participating in the practical attempts at reform. So the question is not how are we participating in the left. I mean, not whether we're participating in the left, but rather how are we participating in the dead left through our critique of it? Because again, this is where we're part of the problem that needs to be overcome. That requires proper understanding, proper recognition, I should say, of what the left today is really doing. It is not reforming anything, but it's essentially educational in nature and character. It is pedagogical. Platypus participates critically in that pedagogy. In other words, how is Platypus part of the dead left? by being a pedagogical project. In other words, if the left is dead because it's not changing the world, but it's basically only teaching about the world, and we think that the problem is that it's providing a miseducation, then of course we're engaged at precisely that level. Right. But critically, but critically, how the education on the left today points beyond itself how the education on the left, the miseducation on the left today points beyond itself. Both historically forward and historically backward. We think the essential role of the left today is how it points back to a more acute historical moment. Uh, in other words, we might be performing an autopsy. You know, there are many ways of thinking about this. Um, so what came up in the earlier discussion was the Luxembourg formulation in the Junius pamphlet. All is not lost if we have not forgotten how to learn. Right? All is not lost if we have not forgotten how to learn. Uh, in other words, um, you know, the left is dead, that formulation comes from Luxembourg, the SPD is a stinking corpse. But all is not lost if we have not forgotten how to learn. Okay. 
Um, with this in mind, uh, I want to come back around because inevitably it is the case that I am retreading what we discussed last year around my president's report, namely the pre-political. And I want to take the opportunity, therefore, to address the intellectual uh, maybe a little bit more than I, I did earlier, although I made the essential point there that Platypus is an intellectual project because we're aware that the left exists today only as ideas. Right? It only exists today as ideas. Um, ideas matter, right? Like, that doesn't make you an idealist, right? that came up on the opening plenary panel. Like, you know, if we're dealing with things at the level of ideas, that's idealism. You have to deal with it in concrete reality if you're a materialist. Um, so David Black. Because uh, it matters, it's material. Huh? It's because the ideas matter. It's exactly, right. So <coughs> David Black, who's a Marxist humanist based in the UK, um, posted something to Facebook that I saw on the bus on my way down today that struck me, namely that Donald Trump is Derrida's triumph. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you wish, right? Um, meaning that that would again make things far more coherent than they actually yeah. are, right? Um, and so basically, the idea is something like this: that Trump is the product of an intellectual culture in which in which objective reality is denied. Meaning that the reason that you can ever hold Donald Trump to anything that he says is that it 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 doesn't refer to any signified, to any like reality outside of itself. And basically all that it refers to is Donald Trump's own reality. And you either want to share in it or you don't, right? But you know, that's not just Trump. That's not just Trump. In other words, that's everybody. That's politics. Um, meaning ideology, right? It's not like there is some material reality that one can refer to to disenchant ideology. You can't. Right? There's no outside of ideology that you can use to dispel ideology. Right? Ideology can only be dispelled from within. And even then, it's not so much dispelled as it is transformed. Uh, and again, ideology is not just ideas at an intellectual level, but it's a felt reality. Feelings are ideological. The way we feel, psychology is ideological. Um, and again, what Platypus tries to do is produce both for ourselves and our target audience, and also for the participants, for the degree to which they can feel it, a productive frustration. So not only a productive confusion, because again, that would just be, I don't know how to make sense of it at the level of a kind of thought, but a frustration, a felt obstacle that one is coming up against, or the voice cracking, you know, which, of course, when we want uh, the people on our panels for their voice to crack, not just for us, but for they, them themselves. And they feel like that happens all the time. Um, and presumably they have the ears for it and not just us. Um, so the issue of you know, expertise and experience, right? Uh, <coughs> via negativa does not simply mean like trial and error. Because that comes up, like learning what doesn't work, right? You try and you fail, and then you try again, and you fail better because you're kind of correcting. No. Um, first of all, because as Horkheimer put it in the Dameron selections, that's a bourgeois model that is precisely falsified by capitalism. In other words, capitalism actually prevents that kind of trial and error that you have a theory and you apply it and then it fails and then you correct your theory. That's not, that's bourgeois society. Like that's reality testing, that's enlightenment, that's bourgeois freedom. Capitalism is actually not tractable to an, an enlightenment approach. It isn't. It could become tractable to an enlightenment approach but on the condition of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Meaning you need that political condition in order to be able to start working through in the bourgeois way. But up till now, you know, it's, it's unclear whether we're trying anything when we try anything in practice. Because it's practice that's ideological. It's not just theory that's ideological. It's practice that's ideological. So what are we developing expertise in? We're not, you know, expertise in the sense of trial and error, what's wrong so that we can figure out what's right ourselves. But rather we're experts in 
being able to feel at all the problem, right? To not immediately avoid it or deny it. And that, again, this is where we're with Adorno. Actionism, right? It's the uh, pseudo-reality within which actionism moves. Right? That that's the problem with the left, is that they do what they do as a way to avoid confronting what we're trying to foster, namely frustration. Right? So, and by the way, when I say they avoid it, I mean they meaning the cadre who remain. So, 9 out of 10 or 95 out of 100 feel the frustration and quit. So the people who are left are the people who are constitutionally incapable of feeling the frustration. <laughs> so they're like really bad. Right? I mean, it, it, it borders on sociopathy. Right? It really does. Um, I, you know, I always dislike psychologizing it, but it's what I said about the 80s, which is, it's not that the left was decimated in the 80s, that 1 out of 10 left the left, but rather 9 out of 10 left the left, and maybe those who didn't quit were not the best but the worst. But then they think of themselves as the best. But maybe the people who quit knew something the people who stayed didn't know. Namely, this ain't happening, people. And so what we have are the people who stayed. Who didn't want to know. Yeah, who didn't want to know, right? Um, or were incapable of knowing or whatever, right? So rather than personally psychologizing it, um, have become experts in avoiding. Right? Uh, whereas what we're trying to do is become experts in not avoiding, which means constantly frustrating ourselves <coughs> and constantly frustrating our audience. Now you see, there's no immediate path out of that towards any kind of practical politics. But what there is, is potentially an indirect effect on those who might try things out of the box. In other words, who might not just try to implement the transitional program in the nth iteration. Right? but who might in fact be willing to really say all bets are off. So what I was in practice, right? So we say all bets are off. And by the way, all bets are off. It's not like our choice that all bets are off. All bets are really off. You either accept it or you don't, but they really are off. All right, there's nothing that you can say, okay, this worked in the past, let's do that. So all bets are off. The only difference between us and other left organizations is that we're willing to say that that's the case and that therefore there's no way forward. There is no way forward. There's, there is no way forward. There might be, but there isn't. Via negative. This conversation tight so we don't go too too far over time. Richard. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so as you know from this tangled. As people know, of course, we live in tangled crisp. Louder. <laughs> as, <clears throat> as people We know, argue a lot, but as people right. But <laughs> what what we share is an overwhelming amount compared to what well, we don't. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm the only thing that gets to be a big one. Or vice versa. So, but I recently, like, instead of just responding to it, I started thinking more and more about the nature of the tension, right? And some of it is about style and vocabulary and pedagogy, um, which get into it. Um, and I was also like thinking about the different elements. Like, obviously, the one element that's different is a different response, not the intellectual content per se, but a different response to the meaning of history of Protestantism, um, in which I feel more of the need to engage the tension and the problem that it has. Um, I think the Frankfurt School is what we have the least really no disagreement on. There is tension about 
at least a couple of different figures, and we'll postpone and get there. Um, but there's another unspoken element, which actually is a large part of classic education, which is what's often described as the history of the revolution, uh -huh. um, which is not about a matter of disagreement, but it's also about, like, under, because oh, we teach about the history of the left, right? We, we, we are focused on the left, which is by definition a modern product of the world society. But in <clears throat> the category of the idea of the death of the left, there's a problem of understanding the relationship of the existence of the left and the world society to a totality of human history even to a totality of existence, right? Which is what is often obscurely reflected in these abstract philosophical arguments. And one of the things that I've also talked about with Chris is the sense in terms of pedagogy that part of the problem with Platypus spaces, so I think there are two fundamental problem, practical problems with that. One is the obvious problem that we're asking people to buy this DNA or to no, not postpone, but suspend, mm. suspend a practical political project, although other times people get confused by the social party But the other is that it's it's the, it's the problem of how one understands the specific education about the lab in terms of a broader general Right? And there's a way in which people come to Blatt, you can see this on the lips, but it's often in some question of that day or history, where Platypus is providing people with imagination of the left, but it's also in some sense supplementing other aspects of the general education. And that we recognize that as a problem, that that aspect of the problem, that the problem of the left, is a world historical problem that brings in the totality of the meaning of human existence and cosmic existence is something that actually sets us apart from the rest of the world. Yep. Right? And it's why we often get tangled up in these obscure philosophical arguments about materialism and idealism and things like that. Because we are talking about, like Kant and Rousseau, are part of the mm -hmm. problem of the education. It's not just Lenin, Trotsky, and Zorn. Right. It's just as much problem as yourself. Right. Right. And that is something that also sets apart the intellectual, or let's put it this way, the pedagogical yeah. aspect of Platypus from the normal aspect. Laurie <coughs> and Gregor. I want to touch on the issue of corrupted frustration um, and the sense that I think that. One way in which productive frustration is expressed in product is the notion of stagnation. Stagnation. Mm -hmm. um, and of our own project, of or, our own of, project. or of the history that we're living well, through. Well, I'm going to get there because there's a conversation okay. happening. Uh -huh. And I think that there's a way in which not seeing and not sensing any sort of shift on the left mm -hmm. feeds back to the frustration of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And the response or the impulse is to say, well, should we be doing something differently right. Right. with virus, Or do we need something else altogether? Mm -hmm. And the problem is it's not always clear where, where people's frustration. And I think actually the interesting thing is that that actually already shows that whatever vision, possibly vision we might have of the situation with virus, is that we probably all not going to go in the same direction as the virus. Right. As if there is potential mm -hmm. positive disintegration of the project and what that looks like for people, as opposed to a negative disintegration mm -hmm. of the project. Uh, and if there's a positive disintegration of the project, the assumption is right like, that something else has come into being that certain members can join, um, and that perhaps certain people in Bibles would still find the necessity to then be perhaps intellectuals and and others who just want to join a party and that necessarily. There could be even different like, political decisions taken at that moment. Well, I think that a couple of years
years ago, or maybe only last year, Spencer said, you know, that as far as politics is concerned, he would expect to be on the opposite side of the barricades from a lot of our members. And, um, you know, that would, that's extremely optimistic, right? In other words, the most productive thing that Marxism ever did was produce a civil war within itself, right? Um, and uh, so that's where it kind of like rankled me on the one hand, but on the other hand, it affirmed the point when Christoph from the IBT said, you know what killed off the Socialist Party of America, the Bolshevik Revolution. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, again, it's a little bit too optimistic. It's just like, well, because the masses learned from the revolution and joined the communist movement, except of course they didn't, right? And so, Jack Ross's book is a good on this as well. Right, like the, the Communist Party was not like bigger than the than the Socialist Party. The party. It was lesser. Go ahead. And I, so, so I wanted to, I think that like, that's a sort of core issue of how people need to express If you're not like Richard like saying, you're not a middle of the about politics, you don't understand it. Oh. And I do believe that that is the case, but that's actually a frustration that's like, Yeah, if you're not ambivalent about it, you don't understand it. That's right. And that goes all the way to the top, meaning I'm ambivalent about politics all the time. Gregor. Um, so your presence report is always very uh, clarifying. I wanted to pick up on two statements of yours. One statement we're already fully familiar with, but I kind of wanted to pick up on that. So you said that the aim of our fora is not to make the incoherent coherent, but to make the incoherent recognize it's incoherent. Mm -hmm. And then you brought up the notion of we want the speaker's voice to crack, not just for us, but for themselves too. So just very practically, can you point to examples of that occurring, where the speakers themselves recognize a productive moment about their participation in the platypus forum? And what effect do you see in maybe those instances, because really the you know the substance of that question is again the question of our impact. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. But mm -hmm. because I've talked to a lot of speakers after four who love talking there, and then if you, if you dig deeper, they don't really understand what we're trying to do. That's okay. So, yeah. but in terms of if we imagine that the voices crack for themselves, that means they actually recognize something. There's a moment. <coughs> a moment. Right. So instances. The recognition and is of our necessity. Yeah, 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 but yeah, exactly. But instances mm -hmm. and kind of the effect. Right. You know, I don't know whether it's some kind of hysterical aphasia or something, but it <laughs> did happen at the panel last night, and now I'm having a hard time remembering it. The moment, like I'll have to you know listen to it again and and, and find it. But I thought it was with Kristoff in particular, yeah. right? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Well, I don't know if this is what you're talking yeah. about, but at one point. He agreed with William Tell's term. Yeah. He was like, well, you can't just tell the workers that you need the party. Right. And then Christoph was like, yes, that's right. And I was like, oh. But then what does that say right. about it, his own project? Uh, Spencer picked up on it after right. the party. I think that was it. Talk about mm -hmm. it, right? But, and, but, yeah. but in 10 years or 9 years of Platypus Bora, like, it happens like often. something we can look to if we, in order we to self We have to understand what that means, though. Just Go ahead. Go ahead. And again, I think that the best scenario of something like that, of having part of the dead left have a moment, it's the best possible scenario of that is that they recognize that plot of the needs to exist. Yeah. Right. That's that's the only thing. That's that's what it means. Because it's again, gonna, it's, it's means something different for people in the audience. Right. Yeah. It's for the audience. And so again, we need the left to see the productive aspect of the of the frustration, even if not in precisely the same terms that we expect the audience to experience it, if that makes sense. And I think it happens quite often. Um, but again, it's one of these things where, the, you know, here's another like curious paradox about platypus. Sometimes I feel like, you know, so I'll go back on what I said earlier, that I've, you know, in a sense, learned nothing from platypus, um, which is that maybe I'm the only one who learns anything from platypus. Sometimes I have that feeling, you know, that it's such a, a rarefied, you know, set of phenomenon that it's like, you know, because I often feel like panels are good where our own members feel like they were bad. Um, now, there's an occupational hazard involved, meaning that if you organize a panel, or if you're on the panel, or if you're moderating the panel, 
you can't really experience the panel, mm -hmm. right? So what I've learned is that the people who are most closely, yeah, that are, they can then when it's objectified, but that, you know, so when I'm thinking of platypus members who think that panels are bad, it's usually not it's just people in the audience. It's usually the organizers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I always have to say, no, actually it was good, but even though you can't, I know why you can't see it, because you're like too close to it or something. And um, so that's just occupational hazard, meaning that if you, if you organize a panel, expect to be disappointed with it in a non-productive way. Every time. Every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Richard? Yeah. Richard? So after the Friday night panel, which I thought was good, I didn't have to do it. Spent like half an hour explaining something in my ear, who was skeptical, why I thought it was good. Right? So then the response is, man, like, like there is a response to that on, well, if it needs to be explained that much, right? If it's this kind of subtle thing, you have to sort of be trained to get, how can you expect the panel to make an impact? Um, and that is another <coughs> problem. I mean, I also had a similar experience with telling people that I should not tell Yeah. Like, the interviews that were this part just felt totally flat. But, like, from certain people who liked it, they really, really liked it. Yep. They did it at the highest rate, including people that had nothing to do with a lot of us. Uh -huh. So, it then becomes this, like, okay, what is the intervention that I'm making right. if, like, only a handful of people? Get the point of the I mean, here's and the other that's part of the frustration that a lot of people feel. Let me just say something about um, what came up earlier about not producing an intellectual milieu. Now, that's true, but we are producing an audience, which is not the same thing as an intellectual milieu, um, because the audience is going to take it wherever. Um, but I do think, and I've always thought, and uh, from the very beginning, that there's no point in thinking of our work or conducting our work, organizing fora, as an instant by instant. Mm -hmm. It's about the ongoing, right? And that means for the audience, too. That we need a consistent audience, we need a consistent readership, that that's where it happens. Because in any single instance, it's not going to work, right, really. Like, because it's too evanescent. There might be these moments, but it's not tangible enough. The proof of it is rather in the arc of the activity. Um, and that's where the impactfulness is frustrating. Yeah, the PR. The PR. Reader. The PR. Reader. Yeah. The whole experience as the whole. The period section. Yeah. It's how it becomes an object of knowledge for the organization, like through the history of the organization. <clears throat> Certainly. Um, Daniel, uh, Divya, Joseph. So this this question of um, the how the panel operates and how it, it sort of um, is a vehicle for acquiring knowledge, um, you know, by way of the via negativa, um, and to the extent that that is a sort of um, as you described a somewhat rarefied, um, um, I guess um, device, if you will, for. Acquiring the knowledge, heuristic. Yeah. Um, yeah. To what to what extent is that is that bound to be a kind of an internal mechanism, or is there a sense in which um, externally, publicly, it would, it would be available to the to the public, the via negativa? Well, that's what I'd say about the four phases of platypus is that um, I don't know that we've had a consistent audience across all four phases. I think that we do have consistent audience. But I think that we experience disruptions and breaks in the consistency of our audience. And I think that that can be tied to the ups and downs of politicization on the left. Meaning, we don't expect the left to be our audience because we can't really convince them of much. All that we can convince them of is that we do something that's interesting, but we can't expect them to really learn much from it. So it's the broader audience but the broader audience is also shaped by the state of like left activism, like, you know, for better or for worse, in terms of we are parasitic in our activity, meaning we can't try to be like Jacket in Magazine. We can't just throw everything on the wall and see what sticks. Right? We're not trying to be all things to all people. We are much more, we're actually not more limited because, right, Jacobin is like five people, right? 
Um, and so we could do a lot more you know, than Jacobin, except we're not trying to in the sense that we're trying to be more discriminating and, you know, and we're not just, again, publishing one-off perspectives is easy, right? It's curating, that's the difficulty. So they've decided that the best way to curate is not to curate. I mean, they just kind of publish yeah, everything. Curate. Yeah, well, that's, they defer, they allow the ISO to do it and they allow Sebastian Budget to do it, but overall, it's kind of like anything that's of interest to anyone on the left is of interest to Jacobin Magazine. So that's like the botching of the all-inclusive, right? Um, where we're trying to do something a little bit different. But we are parasitic. In other words, um, in that respect, we're dependent on what's going on. And so the task for us is to stay engaged. In other words, not to feel like, okay, this new thing that's happening isn't what we're used to, and so maybe it's not really worth it. Right? The, the, the challenge is to stay engaged. Um, I would say that that's the issue, because our external audience is vital, but it remains obscure to us, because we have a lot of lurkers, we have a lot of people who read the PR, the print edition, without ever coming to any of our events. We certainly have a lot of online readership that we never hear from, like we, a lot. There was a guy at Left Forum last year that approached our table saying, I had to read you guys from the issue number one, mm -hmm. and he wasn't a political person, oh. he was, he described himself as a liberal New York Jew living in Miami now, yeah. looking for some publisher. <laughs> uh, feeling that it's fantastic. And I feel like, I mean, that's just like one anecdotal uh -huh. piece of evidence that I feel like, well, if I, I, I yep. can see that being like a bigger phenomenon. Absolutely. But then I'm wondering what to deal, like how to deal with well, that. Well, what, what we've decided say? is to make our audience more targeted, meaning we're certainly not excluding any random person. But the degree to which we're trying to actually actively cultivate an audience, it's young people, students, it's campus environment. Um, now, the other point to that, though, is that we were not made, made thinking long-term. In other words, when we formulated it in the beginning, it was like, yeah, we should cultivate an audience on campus. And so that meant, you know, that we were only looking at a four-year range, right, or something. Huh? We're if we're lucky, right. But, you know, we were optimistic back then. Um, but it works, right? So, Jacob, you encountered us in your first year and came back to us in your fourth year. So it works, <laughs> right? Um, you know, meaning, you, you know, it's kind of go away, but somehow still a lot of this is there. Right? Um, <clears throat> now, how we conduct that in the postgraduate environment, um, especially when we're thinking that we can't afford to be entirely dependent on the constituted activist left because it's such a shrunk milieu now in comparison to when we started and also in comparison to what happened around Occupy. Um, that's the challenge. But it is a challenge, but I also think we ought not to get too disheartened because, in other words, we can't say nobody's reading the PR so don't bother distributing it because mm -hmm. people are in fact reading it. Um, you may not know it, but they are. Even if they so just look at the fun of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and even if they just see it, yeah. yeah. Even if it's just the table of contents getting into their brain sub subliminally or something. Yeah. Um, all right, Divya? Yeah. The issue of cultivating an audience is, is weird because we're trying to cultivate an That sounds depressing just yeah. on the character description. <laughs> <laughs> but then everyone came away from that panel, like all these kids from the philosophy department and my department were like, that was an awesome panel. Of course. And so you know, the bar is very low, people. <laughs> the bar is very low. Right? And it's very different in terms of how you measure the success of a part of the panel. 
But I wanted to push the point about making um, the voices crash. Yep. And, and how we do that in this moment, in our moment, when people are seem to be um, um, even more um, accommodating of each other's perspective. Because the they can't afford differences or something. Yeah. they feel the, besieged. Yeah. yeah, in the issues of solidarity, there's something almost like psychological that prevents any kind of disagreement from appearing. And I was thinking about it in the, you know, in terms of how we ask questions and whether there's a way in, we can, in which we can like push um, the accommodations rather than yes. differences yeah. in a way. Because we're not trying to host debates. Yeah. And there's a difference between pushing and challenging or confronting. Yeah. So our questions shouldn't be challenging in the sense of confrontational. It should be pushing in the sense of pushing in the direction that they're already going, but to the limit. Exactly. Right, and that's where I think that that's a very important point, which is that where there's manifest agreement, pushing the agreement rather than trying to introduce the disagreement, that, you know, because we're not trying to host debates. I mean, if it's battle royale, right, at a certain level, it's only at a certain level, and maybe not manifestly. Yeah. Um, but, and I mean, there's. I know go ahead, good. Yeah. People, but there are, there are also times on panels where it's like people think they disagree, but they really like kind of don't. So it's kind of like that phenomenon. Which or they think they very, disagree and they really agree. yeah yeah yeah. So there, you get like both. So that's um, right. Those can be those can be good if pushed in the right way, and they can also be very like they can also be very bad in the sense that it just becomes like too obscure. Yeah, um, I might have lost our stack. Um, Spencer, you raised your hand, but I'm not sure when you did. Why, why? No, it's not just for a review reader. I saw your hand. Oh, well, before that, I mean, I guess I was just wanting to make manifest the way that Chris's discussion of the Via Negativa at least becomes an issue of the way that our activities relate to one another. Mm -hmm. you know, as you say, as Gregor did, you know, you don't. We're next to a show. You know, we never know if. Yeah, I never feel like I know if an event is successful or not. Mm -hmm. Right? What you're really talking about is the way that the event is being processed in the organization, the way that you turn to other people to think it through, right? The way that what you're really talking, you know, what you're really trying to do is to is to summon that sensibility in yourself. Right? I know that you know, I always feel like I don't know if that was a successful panel or not, and immediately I think, you know, how am I going to talk with yeah. you know, the sense of responsibility? How am I embodying the history of this organization? Uh, so we do know, have to make it productive. Yeah. You know, so, for yeah. instance, with the PR, you, know, you say, well, we never do it in the coffee break. We never read it in the coffee break. But what is reading the PR about, right? It's it is about knowing whether a panel was successful, right? Uh, you'll know when the panels were successful or not when you see them edited, mm -hmm. right? When you think about that, when you read it, and then you think about your experience before and why your experience before and the experience of reading the decision. Um, so the different aspects of the project push each other, right? So the negative, again, it's not that they, you know, they might feel to be in tension or even in subtle contradiction with each other, but the idea is that they push each other. Actually, right. There's a way in which you know, we're trying to, in a sense, organize actively this via negative. The this sensibility is talking about, and it's important for you know. Or, or when uh, Divya says, you know, it was well curated, but it failed. Mm -hmm. Right. There, really, you know, I I think that. I think even a failed panel is a success. Sure. If you productive would be if you're productively reflecting on, you know, for instance, with the black politics panel, uh -huh. um, how it really might have been a success because it revealed the problem. Right. What were the problems in terms of curation? Were they incidental? We didn't get Cedric Johnson, uh, or are they saying something about our time? Right. How do they relate to previous iterations of the same thing? Right, so how is our activity allowing us to think about the history of the left, to think about the present? As we're living through it. 
Yeah, and to think about the history of our organization. Right? And how, like, that's what I you know, would encourage people to think about in terms of a practical, I mean, there's a, there's a very practical sense in which the tripod relates to one another, uh, but there's also, uh, uh, there are also other sort of meta levels uh, that I think I this mean, is addressing. So the, the issue of sustained audience, also having speakers speak on multiple events, yeah. having yeah. sustained engagements with speakers, um, and, and also engagements of a different kind, meaning maybe they speak on a panel or a couple of panels and maybe they write an article for the PR or maybe they write in response to an article for the PR. Richard. Yeah, I just, I'm saying all the description of the competition is starts with the bottom of the competition. Uh-huh. And then we work into this question, which is a good discussion about panels and how they interpret them. It's the yeah. how. Right, right, I understand that. And that's an even important conversation to have. But one of the aspects of political civilization and conflict, of course, is the direct pedagogical aspect. Uh huh, okay. Right, namely, you, first of all. And also, one of the frustrations that I have in terms of the long term viability of conflict is the question to what extent is a sense of pedagogical conflict being transferred to other people? Uh huh. Right? So one of the, the problems you have in front of us is the feeling of loss of members, including loss of senior members, of self-doubt about their ability to teach class. And I think that that's something that imperils the long-term viability of our project, in addition to the general collapse of the last of the Can I make a plea for the <laughs> contingency of that? Uh, meaning, we have developed experienced pedagogues in Platypus who then find themselves, for one reason or another, no longer doing it. So, for instance, Spencer's in Virginia, so he's no longer doing it. Or Ben Blumberg is demoralized, and so he's no longer doing it. Um, whatever, you know, and there are people who come back who did it and then come back to it, and, you know, so. I'm always a little bit, like, usually I'm definitely not the glass half full. I'm definitely the glass half empty. I'm like, you know, more people do more. But I also want to kind of caution us to say we have developed pedagogical resources. But there are factors in practice that prevent us from bringing our full pedagogical developed resources to bear from year to year. It, and it should be, I mean, first of all, we're, as I understand it, we're doing more reading groups than ever. Yep. Uh, and I think it's good. I think it's working. It's also important to see that we've short circuited what I think we were really doing in Chicago before, which is actually trying to teach people how to teach. You mean assistant pedagogues? That's that, yes. One well, of not just that, right? Okay. That Chris and I, when, you know, when we did it, we were already professional teachers, right? Um, you know, and and we short-circuited trying to do that, mm. right? That you you know reflect upon our experience teaching them for the University of Chicago and guidelines and that and how you, uh, you this is something you know, we just we, as I understand we're getting undergraduates to, to teach or people in their young twenties to do the reading group. You know why? Because you know, and again, I only have myself to draw upon at the end of the day. Meaning, when I was 19 years old, Spartacus Youth Club, I sat down the children who were my age, and I taught them what I had just learned from the Spartacus League. It can be done. It, can be done. it must be done. Okay, uh, yeah. Stefan? Yes, I feel, I think Richard is also bringing this up because I've talked to him a lot about this problem, and I have the feeling like what we we're talking about, you know, recreating the experience you yourself had when joining Platypus in younger members, and that it's hard for us to to measure our success and mm. this this problem that if I'm presenting and that I'm if I'm pushing younger members, that I I'm afraid I create like this. The, this instant experience, this plastic experience of platypus, you know, like trying to... You mean pre-digested? No, that, that I'm like panning out some reified concept of right. what yeah. it would mean because uh, I was bringing it up like we have here 
we were discussing the raison d'etre teaching, which you gave some years ago. And I was telling that at some points you just, don't get me wrong, I just, at some points you just have to repeat what you just learned. Yeah. You have to yeah. repeat what you were told so you understand it. Mm -hmm. You can't understand it fully when you're learning. That's right. And that's the process. And it's difficult to, to digest it. Or to, to moralize it. Like, in other words, um, there's a lot of inhibition. I mean, certainly the experience that Spencer is invoking about being a grad student teacher, that one immediately feels inhibited. And in the sense of um, you're not sure, like, how you know how to do what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? But you do, right? In other words, for me, you know, like, as a young teacher, I was kind of like, it's do or die, maybe. meaning I know what I know, I can teach. If I can't teach now, it's not like I'm going to be able to teach 10 years from now, you know? Um, and so it is a kind of moral leap in the sense of motivation, right? And I think that that's where it came up, right? That it really is about the young people presenting themselves, teach me, right? Like, at the end of the day, we have to create those opportunities. In other words, we can't... <laughs> The danger in Platypus is that, in a sense, we uh, get in the way of that happening, right. right? But as long as that happens, then I think it's motivated. I do. Um, but, but we do sometimes shoot ourselves in the foot and, in a sense, actively avoid or prevent that. Yeah. I think there's a tension also because of the nature of the project. Because of it's, you know, because you're not really a Platypus member until you feel ambivalent about the project. Uh -huh. Sometimes this comes out in a sort of sense of not knowing enough. Right, that maybe I'm ambivalent because I don't know enough, and so that but that's I can't a, that's teach. the excuse right? that it's people like, give themselves. Like, well, I can't teach because I'm not fully committed because I need to be fully committed in order to teach. Yep. But it's sort of backwards. And it's yep. like, well, at the end of the day, right, it's about understanding through doing, and that one comes to deal with one's ambivalences through organizing yep. for us, doing the teaching, pedagogy, etc. Sometimes that has to be made clear to our newer members who might experience their ambivalence as yeah, no, no, no. unreadiness, right? Or yeah. not prepared enough. Because you'll never be ready enough. Right? Yeah. Because the point really is to push them into positions in which their you know, readiness comes through yep. feeling unprepared. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Exactly. Yep. Is the anxiety of wanting to explain every single line of attack that will get you to try to get it? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's adjourn this part. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> so we're only an hour behind schedule now. What's the three o'clock? It's it's three o'clock now.